Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Today, a draft breakdown with Chris Cooley. He likes a couple players the Redskins picked in particular, and we discuss if the Redskins blew it at tight end and also some of the Trent Williams saga. Then I talk a little bit more about two draft picks that I really like, Antonio Gibson and Antonio Gandy-Golden. Both are intriguing, and I'll share more as to why. And again, I'll wrap up with some thoughts on the Trent Williams situation. Don't forget to read my work on ESPN.com where I have complete analysis on every Redskins pick. And I'll have a story on Gibson that will be out, I believe, on Wednesday. And now, here's my conversation with Chris Cooley. Now I'm joined by Redskins legend and my friend, Chris Cooley talking about the draft. We're going to get into the Trent Williams trade in a few minutes, but let's start with the draft because that's the thing that everybody wants to talk about more. In general, what did you think of this draft? Well, Kyle, I always appreciate you having me on. It's always fun to talk ball with you. And I think this is a draft with the Redskins that, that you have to just be really excited about what I think is, is the most solid player, the best player in the draft that's not a quarterback. I, I feel like that position's almost exempt from saying best player in the draft. Right. Because to me, it was always it was just Joe Burrow, quarterback, so important. But Chase Young, other than that, to me, is far and far and away the most sure thing. And you expect him to be Von Miller like, which changes changes defenses. Changes I, I, you got to be. He's just a freak, man. I mean, he's just absolutely freakish, and you love everything about him. So that to me was huge. I would have loved to have seen them get a second for Trent Williams. Right. I, I know you, we want to talk about that. They didn't. But um, as you get into the third round, I love Antonio Gibson. So he do I. One, he was one of my favorite players in this draft. He's listed as a running back out of Memphis. They talked about him as a receiver out of Memphis. He's 230 pounds, six foot. To me, he's an H-back or he's – Christian McCaffrey with what they did with him last year. This guy's a heck of a route runner that was listed as a running back that caught a ton of passes. He's incredibly explosive after the catch. He makes big play after big play down the field. He, he runs hard. He breaks tackles. He plays football the right way. Antonio Gibson, to me, was an absolute steal. I know that there were some thoughts about Gibson just because of the uncertainty of what he is, the hybrid type right. player that he is that he might fall into the fourth or fifth. Right. But I know that Kyle Smith absolutely adored Gibson, loved him on film. And to me, that's where I'm proud of him to go and take him where they took him. You had a guy that you wanted yeah. and you went and got him. He might, he might have fallen another round. By the way, that's interesting, Kyle, because defensive hybrid players a lot of times go higher because they're hybrid. That, that's off, true. Well, and these hybrid guys. No. These guys are right. These guys are big on versatility. And my thinking is too, like I thought he might go in the fourth, maybe into the fifth. But if you do like a guy, I think he can help you, then you go get the guy. Absolutely. Uh, I just I love that theory. I hate the best player on the board theory. Get guys that fit your offense or defense. Get guys that suit your needs. Draft them. I mean, you don't reach three rounds, but right. I don't think you knew where Gibson was going to go. I don't think you knew if he was going to fall to the fourth round or, or stay where he was at. So I like that pick a lot. Um, Charles out of LSU, I think is a good player. He's, he's a three-year starter at LSU. So you know the guy can play. He's a big dude. I think he's got quick enough feet. He can move a little bit. I, I don't know exactly where he fits in. I think he's a bit of a work in progress. But at the same time, I think he's enough of an athlete to be a starter in this league, and you get him in the fourth round. So I like Charles out of LSU quite a bit, Kaim. I think that's a that's a really good pickup for the Redskins where they got him. Uh, Cameron Curl is a guy out of Arkansas who I didn't watch a ton, but he's a three-year starter. I think he's just a little stiff. He seems a little tight, but – Sometimes you get those stiff, tight guys that 
are willing to just drill dudes. I don't know what right. it is about that. How about Gandy Golden, the receiver? Yeah, yeah, Gandy Golden is another one of my favorite picks in this draft. I, it, it's fun to watch some of the background on some of these guys. And, right. you know, you don't go and watch a ton of film on Liberty wide receivers <laughs> and, until you, you kind of see what it is after the fact. But, man, I love smart football players. He is as smart as it gets. Hey, there's a video of him doing a, the Rubik's Cube in 40 right. seconds. By the way, there's a simple algorithm for that or a twist and turn method for that. But um, <laughs> I like him as a football player. I like his size. I like his athleticism. I, I think he's, he's a heck of a route runner. I think he's an incredibly smart player. He'll pick things up very fast. He'll do everything the way you want him to do things. So that, that to me, was another big-time pick. And I love when you get guys that, you, you know, are close that you kind of feel like you know. And, and to be honest with you, I'm going to go ahead and – and say I don't know anything about James Smith Williams out of NC State or the other seventh seventh round pick Cameron Curl out of Arkansas. Right, but, uh, and and that's fine because you know the big ones. Listen, we're looking at guys who can help do some help right now, and I think that's Gibson and Gandy Golden. You know, it's funny because with Gandy Golden, I was I'm. Did you see the? Did you see him against Syracuse? He, oh, he, he's a baller. Yeah, and he just. And the funny thing is, I know like one of the knocks on him is his speed. But he had no trouble getting off, you know, this is more quickness, but he had no trouble getting off the line. And, the, you know, Syracuse was up pressing him. He had no trouble getting off the line. So either he's better in that area than maybe some people think or the Syracuse corners were pretty bad. But that was a game that, to me, opened my eyes, too, because you're playing up, you know, in terms of talent level, whatever. Um, and, and he had a really good game. But he can go attack the ball. He's a guy that maybe can jump in there. Both those guys, he and Gibson, should be able to provide immediate help, don't you think? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think Gibson's going to be a guy that is essentially one of your starters the right. way you do it on offense now because of rotation. He might not play the right. entire game, but I think they use him a ton. And, yeah, Gandy Golden, you know, he probably fell where he did because of the the glut of receivers that sure. went on through the first three rounds in the draft. And there were some big-time guys. And, and that's where you would have loved to have a second-round pick because right. some big-time players went in the second round. But at the same time, in another year, Gandy Golden might be a second rounder. He might be a third rounder. Right. Uh, he, and he might end up playing like a first or second rounder. One of the hard things that scouts have with guys from Liberty or from small schools is evaluating them against real talent. And so they don't always trust exactly what they see. And I think Gandy Golden's a playmaker, man. Can go get the ball down the field to make some plays. Yeah, he should fill in and, and, and help. And they, they do need help at receiver. I would like to see him get a receiver. I would like to see him get a, a, a true inline Y tight end that can right. block and get down the field. I know they signed Thaddeus Moss. I don't see Thaddeus Moss as a Y. You know, I've been talking for two months now since the NFL PA Bowl that I coached at. And I had a couple guys there that I liked. But Charlie Warner that was on the other right, team. Right, you were on him, yeah. He, yeah, and the 49ers drafted him in the sixth round. I thought he could have went much higher. He ran slow at the combine. He ran like four seven something, four seven eight, almost four eight. Yeah, it was, which yeah. hurt his stock because he wasn't a big time receiver at Georgia. But to me, like someone like that, one of those fifth round picks or a sixth round pick would have been a big time pick. I do think you're going to get some help from Gibson out of Memphis. Well, and let me. I'm going to get before I'm going to get back to the tight ends in a second. But with Gibson, I know part of the plan is you know how much can a guy like that help regulate a defense because he can do so much and you can line him up at different spots and you can pair him with a Peterson or a Geis or somebody like that. How much can that versatility kind of regulate and, and mess with the defense? I think it's massive to have at least one, if not two hybrid type players on the field because you can't put a label on those guys. And so it defines your defense when you, take them outside of the line of scrimmage or you put them at the fullback position or wherever it may be in the slot with another one of those guys that all of a sudden now motions out of the backfield and you're saying, okay, we have to show what we have here. It's a really good way to manipulate the defense on the back end to see the coverage, to understand what you have. And so I, I think that's big time. I also, you know, it's been fun watching teams like Baltimore and, and Kansas city with a lot of their, multi backfield sets and what they're able to do with those things and I think Gibson's capable of that I don't think he'll be a running back for the Redskins I don't think they drafted a running back when they drafted him I well, think I they think, drafted a receiver but yeah and I know a, like or an I, back. I mean, that's what yeah, he is 
And I know, like, in their thinking, and teams were talking about him as a running back, but when they're talking about his running back, they think that's where – because he's going to be able to carry the ball. But it's really more about the hybrid aspect of his game because, again, then the thinking is if you go to a heavy box, you can split them out. If they go to a light box with he and Geis in there or he and Peterson, then you can put them in the backfield or put someone in the backfield and run the ball. So it's, I think it's about that versatility. Just in, he's, He should be listed as offensive weapon. <laughs> yeah, that's a, he should want to be listed as a receiver so that when they end up having to pay him, that they have to pay him oh, like a receiver. True. That's true. <laughs> but, that's that's true. Offensive weapon, I don't know what the tag is on that at this point. That, that's, that's a good point. Hey, let's go to the tight ends. And my thinking was during the draft, which I said this, is that it, was such, it wasn't a great draft for tight ends. So the depth wasn't there, and it was going to be hard to find a guy that maybe, you know, when you look at their roster, to me, they have a lot of guys already in that category. And what they needed was a guy that could come in and maybe provide some immediate help. And I didn't know if they – I didn't think they were going to find a guy at that spot. Do you agree with that or do you look, you know, because to me, they still need a guy who can go like, you know, whether it's an OJ Howard, somebody who can come in and really provide legitimate help for Dwayne Haskins or do you, what, what do you think? Well, they're going to have to find a way around it, circumvent it. They're going to have to implement guys like Sprinkle, maybe Thaddeus Moss is a guy that you, you can get by with in the line of scrimmage and get away with some things. You never know exactly what the plan is right there. I, I I am with you that I don't think that there were a lot of guys in the draft that would be that versatile guy. Uh, to me, it was like Komet was legit. I liked Aussie Aussie, who went pretty like early him. out of UCLA. I, I personally think Charlie Warner was one of the better tight ends in, in the draft. Yeah. I mean, I don't know much about the position, but to me, I absolutely <laughs> love the guy. I liked so. Aussie Aussie, and I know they liked him too. I was a little bit surprised that he went in the third, but I also think it was an example of – there aren't a, it's not a great tight end class. So if you really like a guy, just like with Gibson, take him where you, you like the guy, take him. And, and that was, that was the start of where he probably should go. Um, but it, to me, that's still an area where you're going to have to get somebody else in here. Yeah. Uh, and you, you can't always address every need through the draft. Right. I know that, that you want to, I think that there was probably some potential to do that, but it didn't fall that way. And you, you also never know, like maybe they were going to take a tight end and one of them got picked within five picks before them or one, you know what right. I'm saying? Right. So I think that's, that's pretty tough to kind of figure out. And I think the other thing, Chris, with that too, is this is where I wonder, had they been able to trade Trent for a, let's say get a third round pick in this draft, would they have then used one of those picks to maybe trade for an OJ Howard versus getting it next year. And I know there's a reluctance for their, on their part to part with any picks in 2021. So I just wonder if they had done that, if they had, because that was something they, they discussed was, was Howard. I just wonder if they'd had another pick in this draft that they would have given up a third or a fourth to get him, and then there's your guy. I don't think is on the table for a third. Well, I don't know that Tampa would have done that. But I, I think what, they would probably have done it for a second. And yes. so then in theory, if you got – if you traded Trent for a second, you could have traded that for Howard. Or you, I'm sure that they had discussions about trading Trent somewhere in the draft for a, a potential spot. I didn't see any second round tight ends that they would have wanted. So Howard would have been the, the thing in the second. Um, we'll see. I, I mean, yeah. you, you find ways around certain positions and, you know, you can implement guys like Gibson and – right. Guys that move around, Stephen Sims Jr., you can be in 11 personnel a lot more often. And, right. You know, you, you figure it out, and that's what they're going to have to do. Well, I think that's where the Gibson pick gives them that ability to, to attack defenses in different ways, and that's why I like the versatility, because it does allow you to play multiple ways. And so that's, again, I think that's the biggest thing he adds. Um, last thing on the draft, when you look at too often, so often in the past, we'd always hear they're not on the same page, front office, coaching staff, not on the same page. It feels like Ron, Kyle Smith and Ron Rivera are on that same page, that they have a good working relationship. Well, how, do, how much do you think that matters? And do you, do you think that it was a big problem in the past? Well, I think it's incredibly important that the coaching staff be on the same page with the scouting staff and the college scouting staff and, and Kyle have a really good understanding of what Ron Rivera wants. Uh, for, I'll use Gibson as an example. 
you can love Gibson as a scout watching his film and you can sit there and say to yourself, this guy could be an H back. This guy could be a slot receiver. He could be whatever you want him to be. But if your head coach doesn't want to play a guy that way, then it's worthless to continue to watch right. that guy or spend time on a guy like that. And so Rivera's got to be able to say to Kyle, these are the type of guys that I need. These are the type of players that I want. This is the mentality attitude that I, I, I have to get out of guys in this draft. These are the possible risks you can take on certain positions. And then Rivera's got to trust Kyle to find those guys. Obviously they're going to go in and spend time in, in the, couple months before the draft after free agency but the head coach doesn't have nearly the amount of time right. to evaluate 500 prospects and so he's got to be able to trust his scouting department they have to trust him on what he wants and if you're not on the same page then you end up drafting you end up having the 2009 Redskins draft right right and, or a few others too because it or even just some of the free agents any of them. yeah or any of them yeah yeah because there were times in the past where like like a Zach Brown for example coaches didn't want him players didn't want him and yet they resigned. And I don't think a lot of guys in the front office really wanted him. And yet he was resigned. And, like, you know, there's some guys that just – I always felt like there were mismatched parts at times. It feels like you're not – you know, you're, they're doing a better job of saying – identifying guys and the coach is saying this is what we need. And then those guys going out and finding guys that fit what those guys want. I think. It's, it's the only way that you can really get guys that, that you believe in. And that um, you, you trust and, and guys that fit your system. And, and it's so vastly important. And it's so important that it begin very early in a relationship. And so next year they can continue to build and really understand each other even more. And to me, that's why, you know, you know GM and head coach is the most important relationship in sports. Right. And so I also think it'll be interesting, you know, this process kind of, at least a little bit away from the draft, but this process of, how much does he trust Kyle Smith after going through this process with them? And how much do the rest of the scouts matter? And what other changes will happen within the building based on what Ron sees out of Kyle in the scouting department? I, I think you never likes potentially in the upcoming weeks. And I think, we'll, you know, I think we'll see how much he trusts him already. And I do think of that deal ultimately, and there's just the way the whole thing played out. Well, it to me got to the point where, You'd rather have something rather than not. It needed to play out that way. I was hoping maybe, but it clearly was an issue of the Washington Redskins. You and I, you could flim flam around not playing and still getting paid. And so you can't get nothing for a guy. Um, I mean, there, there were other potential possibilities that I've, I've thought of something like, a fourth this year and right. a conditional second next year if they sign him to a long-term contract right. or whatever it may be or you or you know two two thirds next year. I don't know but to me getting something rather than nothing was was so important because Trent Williams is an incredible football player right he's, he's to me, the best left tackle in the NFL, I'm not concerned about him playing to the level that he played at. I think he will. A lot of times guys like that, a year off is actually beneficial. Right. And, and so it, it almost goes unnoticed at times just how good he is. But I'll promise you this, Kaim, any GM or head coach, they can play any game they want with who wants to be here and who doesn't. But when they put on Trent Williams' film, you have to just say, wow. Plays for him too. That off. I mean, Kyle obviously loves. Uh, and that's. I think that's the perfect thing to stretch and get on the edge. Well, I'm disappointed in that. You have to pay me my money. It, who's, it, they did a deal. It's it's funny because I'm watching all the Michael Jordan stuff. I'm sure you are. It's it's amazing. Yep. But the whole should have signed a better deal, man. Well, I, I think it was the contract that he was playing for, and he believes that he's worth. I, um, I, there's something we'll never know. Is maybe right. they promised him they. But I don't think that happened, Kaim. And, and I, you know, if you're going to do it, he did. It's easier for them to move him early rather than late. Get that first round offer. I, I'm nearly convinced of it. I've never. talked to enough people that are close enough to it. Me there too. was never a we're answering phones. That's bull. Right. I mean, it's, there's so many ways to get in touch with people and get an, communicate an offer. 
I mean, well, I, I, know, I think I've heard of a fax machine. You can text. an email. Well, like, listen. Come on. Like, I talked the, the to offer wasn't there. It wasn't available. It wasn't made as a completely mishandled Trent Williams because they were nation. Right. You know, it's funny with the first round pick because I know the rumor was going, and I had people here talk, tell me, like, I talked to John, John Dorsey. That's and, and like, and they know that Bruce talked to him. So there was, and I think the best the Browns ever gave was like a fourth or a fifth. After this break, I'll be back with a few thoughts, including ways that Gibson can impact an offense and how Gandy Golden can help Terry McLaurin. Welcome back. Now here are a few more of my thoughts. And I want to expand more on Antonio Gibson because he's a guy I really like. And if, if he pans out the way they hope, he can have a solid impact and lessen the sting of not finding some other players on offense. I don't want to go overboard on him. I just think his skill set can lend itself to that. Again, if he pans out, you always have to add that and please hear that part because we don't know yet. I know Chris and I talked about it, but, I, but think of it like this. And this is how it's been communicated to me. The Redskins can put him on the field at the same time as an Adrian Peterson or Darius Geis or even J.D. McKissick. You probably wouldn't put them both in the backfield at the same time, but you can do certain things. The Eagles used to do that with Darren Sproles and, and Sean McCoy. But, when, you are, but they, when they are on the field at the same time, technically it's now a two running back set. You could go empty and see how the defense responds. If they go with the sub package, you shift someone to the backfield and you run the ball. If they go with a base defense, now you have a potential mismatch in coverage versus a guy like Gibson. Now, things always sound much better on paper, of course, but that's the thinking. Other factors have to go right for it to work, but in the past, they'd use a tight end in this role. Now, they only need to use one. Or as Chris said, they could go with a three-receiver set. You go empty again with Gibson on the field. That's a definite nickel package. Now you can shift into the backfield and run the ball against a lighter box. It should be fun to watch. Again, whether or not it works, don't know, but that's what versatility does for an offense. I also think with the addition of Antonio Gandy-Golden that it allows the Redskins to use Terry McLaurin more at the Z position if they so desire. Last year, he was primarily an X. They can use Gandy Golden at the X and McLaurin at the Z. Why is that important? Because it then puts McLaurin on the side of the tight end, and that prevents certain coverages, coverage schemes from trying to take him out of a play. For example, if he's aligned with a slot receiver and a three-receiver set, then the defense can let the corner switch if they need to. So you're still getting a corner on a receiver. But a defense isn't going to switch with a guy covering a tight end. Now, again, it's, it doesn't lead to automatic success. But they did, and they did use McLaurin at this spot at times last year, so it's really not a new thing, but it is something they can do more of than they did in the past. Just another thing to watch when, you're, when, you're, when we're looking at, you know, through preseason games, hopefully, and the regular season. Finally, there are a couple others I want to cover, and I'm going to start with center Keith Ishmael and defensive end James Smith-Williams. I don't know how these players are going to do, but I think they're both products of the you-never-know-when-a-need-becomes-a-need mentality. Ishmael gives the Redskins more potential depth inside, at center or guard, but perhaps also some cover if they don't re-sign Chase Ruye after this year. Heck, Wes Martin might be in competition for that center job this summer anyway. I don't know. I think he'll contend more at left guard, but they also wonder about him at center. So we'll see. But let's assume Ruye keeps the job. He's, he does some things very well. Very smart guy. He'll be a free agent after the season. And if they don't want to sign him or re-sign him, they should now have or could now have replacement options on the roster. And, and keep in mind when they're putting together this line and all that, they have a new line coach and a new offensive system. So though that's always going to factor in now. So now Ismail becomes their guy, so to speak. And so we'll see. And then the, the same is true of Smith Williams when you're looking down the road. You always want to find more edge rushers. And I really, and really what I know about him is that he was hurt a lot in college. He might not do anything. I don't know. Um, guys drafted in the late rounds, though, are meant to be developed for future spots. After this season, Ryan Kerrigan will be a free agent. At one point, I thought he'd be extended. Now, I think it's a definite we'll-see approach. So the Redskins need to try start trying to have guys worth developing. Clearly, 
the ends of the future are, are Montez Sweat and, of course, Chase Young. And you got Ryan Anderson, who's in that mix as a kind of a hybrid type player for them. But I think he'd probably play some of their down there as well. Um, you have Jordan Brailford that you could end up developing, depending on how he comes through this year. And Smith Williams would not replace what Kerrigan does, of course, but maybe he can provide some level of help in the future. If other guys become elevated, you still need that fourth or fifth defensive end who can help you in a pinch. And if not, if he doesn't become that guy, can end up, it could end up becoming a need to find a guy like that. And so that's why you end up getting guys like that, especially at those positions. You have to look at future ramifications, and I think that's a couple things there. And the last guy I'm going to talk about is Kaliki Hudson, the linebacker slash safety from Michigan. Again, he's a hybrid guy. He's not a big guy. He's not big. He's only like 5'11", 225, something like that. Has good speed for a linebacker, not great speed for a safety. Good, good, Pretty good size for a safety, not good size for a linebacker. But I really think what this is all about for them is special teams. They love this guy because of how he hits. I think one guy told me he could be a special teams demon. So we'll pay attention to that. But that's those, But I just wanted to close out on the, some of the draft picks with some more information that I can share with you. And now we go. All right, now I'm going to get on to the Trent Williams trade. It was a crazy week, and I want to walk you through it, and bear with me because I really don't want to go into depth in this any anytime soon again, but because it just happened, I do want to go over this again. So last week, I had reported that Minnesota and two other unnamed teams were interested in Trent. Couldn't really figure out exactly who, but I also knew that San Francisco would be involved if they felt Joe Staley was going to retire. That was always another team that I and others mentioned in the week leading up to the draft, but it was always with the caveat that we didn't know if he would retire or not. So, But that was a team to watch if that happened. I know some people, especially those in Minnesota, kind of doubted that anyone else was really interested. They always felt that they could get Williams on the cheap. Had the Vikings simply upped their offer a few weeks ago, he'd probably be theirs now, I think. Or had they made the offer they made on Friday when they were willing to include another mid-round pick, I think that probably would have gotten the deal done at that time. Minnesota at that time was on the preferred destination list by Williams and his agent. The final debate was really over which um, other mid-round pick to include, but it was close enough that I think they could have. Clo- I think they could have closed the gap. Um, the, the Vikings, despite having at the time 12 picks, kind of tried to slow play it. Whether or not this will cost them, I don't know. They drafted a tackle in the second round, if you, but if you're trying to make a Super Bowl run, would you rather have Ezra Cleveland plus the third and fifth round pick, or would you rather have Trent Williams? Well, Williams is still one of the best tackles in the game, but that's the decision that kind of came down to. If Cleveland turns out to be a good tackle, then they made the right call because he could play for them for a long time, and he's a lot cheaper right now. But the reality is they picked Cleveland because the Williams pursuit was over before or moments before the second round began. That's when... Um, Williams reportedly, and and I had heard this too, um, told them he wouldn't play for him. I'll get to that in a minute. The Redskins Vikings both believe Williams' aside told them he didn't want to play for them shortly before the draft restarted on Friday. Um, The Vikings had been among the preferred destinations again, like I said. The part I don't know is what changed his mind. On Thursday night, I received a text from someone involved in this whole situation who said a trade was done. It would be announced on Friday. Another person immediately said, no, nothing was done. So we waited. But that's where the situation was. As we always heard, it could happen in five minutes. It could happen in in five hours. Nobody really knew. I don't know which team that person was talking about, but I now suspect the Niners knew they could pull it off. I wonder if the Niners communicated to him that they could pull off. And maybe that's why there was a, a, maybe that's why it was communicated to the Redskins and or the Vikings that Williams would rather um, play for the Niners and not the Vikings. He knows Kyle Shanahan. He's a perfect fit in that offense, and he's a fan of Shanahan. It made sense that he'd want to play there. But instead of getting a third in this draft, the Redskins received a third in 2021. Now, when teams do the equivalency charts, that would be the equivalent of a fourth-round pick right now in terms of value. But it is over, and they'll have some more flexibility next year in the draft in those middle rounds. So we'll see. And yes, um, the Redskins, excuse me, the Rams were interested in him, but the feeling was they lacked the cap room to make it work. They also wanted him at guard, and Trent does not want to play guard. He was excellent without having practiced there for a brief stint a few years ago, 
but it always he always bristled at any notion that they should, should slide him inside to play him and Ty and Seki together on the left side. You don't move guys who are among the best at a premium position. And again, there were some times where we'd be talking to Trent and just kind of joke about, make a joke about him moving to guard. And he always would laugh about it, but he'd always give that look like, man, I'll never go there. Now, certainly not anytime soon. And this was a few years ago when he was still, you know, he was less than 30 years old. It wasn't going to happen. And so I'm not surprised that he wouldn't want to do that. How happy am I this is over? Well, it's hard to express the number of extra hours that myself and guys like J.P. Finley put in, or Les Carpenter put in over the last several weeks, and the past week in particular, on monitoring this. It's no lie that I probably had nine combined hours of sleep over three days last week during the draft, as you knew a trade could happen at any time. And Friday night was crazy because that's when it was learned that Williams had scuttled the trade to Minnesota. I'd heard this before the draft was over, but not strong enough to report. Ian Rappaport then went on the air with it. I heard from Trent around 1 a.m. and he said, no, that's not true. So that was part of the story that we went with the next day. But I wanted to hear from more people. So you text till around 2.30 in the morning. You get up around 5.30 because you really can't sleep. You wrote the story, waited to hear from more people. It was kind of crazy. The number of texts, emails, and calls made to try and learn the other teams. That was crazy. That's how, it was, that's how I was able to get a little nug out Friday that the Rams were had shown interest. I didn't know... I didn't know um, at that time how serious it was, but you knew that there was some interest. I didn't know about the guard thing that kind of came out um, Saturday. I knew it was not as serious as other teams, again, because they're cap. But I'm also guessing the time that I heard that, they may have, they may have already been out. Um, so that's where it was kind of tough. But and again, Williams denied that he ever told anybody they didn't want to play in Minnesota. Regardless, and it was in this whole situ- this whole way it played out was regardless was symbolic of the entire situation. The, the sides claiming something different. It's been that way from the jump. With Williams saying it was about the medical and the Redskins maintaining it was all about money. I know the fans are done with it. I can tell you the Redskins are, and I most assuredly am, as are the other reporters. It's disappointing the way it played out. To be honest, I, Williams should have retired from the Redskins. He should have been a guy that you'd see up in the and you know um, honors for his play here someday. Maybe that'll still happen. Who the heck knows? That, that's a long time from now. But I know from the immediate time, I would love to have seen Chase Young going against Trent Williams during one-on-one drills in Richmond. And now it's over and we move on. I think I felt freedom and the ability to breathe easier the moment that trade was made. And I can tell you that probably JP, Les Carpenter, Ben Standig, Matt Paris. Anybody, you know, Steve Wino, anybody who's really, who's on that beat, you know, on, on a daily basis, Randon Walker, um, you know, uh, Peter, Peter Haley, anybody out there, Sam Fortier, oh, I'm going to mention everybody, Michael Phillips, everybody, all of us. I know that I know they have to feel the same. Everybody, I'm sure all of you listening, we're ready for it to end. Again, now we move on. And that's it for this week. I greatly appreciate Chris Cooley joining me. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And I want to remind you that during this time, while you think I'm serving as a distraction for you, this also serves as a distraction for me. I love talking ball. I hope that shines through. Talk to you next time. Got another good guest coming up.